but we're going to have some fun tonight. So the, the, the topic of, of tonight really is, do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the Bible? This is one of the questions that people always want to ask. Do you believe in the Bible? And most Christians get really sort of antsy about this, really uncomfortable about this. But when you break it down, as Jordan Peterson would, you've got to break down the question. Okay? You've got to analyze the question. In other words, you've got to tear the question apart to really get to the true meaning. Because what is it that you're actually asking me when you say, do you believe in the Bible? Are you asking me, do I believe that this book here is a physical, tangible presence that I can touch, taste, see, and smell? Well, then absolutely, yes, I believe 100% in the Bible. Absolutely 100%. Are you asking me, you know, well, well, do you believe in the stories of the Bible? Well, given the fact that the Bible is one of the greatest historical documents that ever has been produced and ever exists or existed, then absolutely, yes, you know, I'm two for two right now. What about, do you believe in the, in, in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus? So now we're getting somewhere because you're getting really specific. So again, you want to have people be really specific when they ask you questions. This is where the psychology comes in. So, if you're asking me, do you believe in the death, the life, the resurrections, the teachings of Jesus? Well, the teachings of Jesus are some of the most fundamental teachings, you know, that, that we have on the face of the planet. If you actually go in and you understand it, and if, if you're someone tonight with, you know, again, you, you haven't just come to poke fun at Christianity or faith at Christianity, because believe me, there's a lot that you can poke fun and faith at, and, and you don't need to start with the Bible. You can just start with church on a Sunday morning and stuff that they want to poke fun at. Some of the lunacy that, that has been allowed into our churches nowadays is beyond comprehension, but we won't get onto that tonight because that is a completely different lecture entirely. But here's the amazing thing. When you ask me, do I believe in the teachings, death, life, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, even if we're not looking for a spiritual point of view, we're looking at a physical point of view. And the life of Jesus Christ was both documented historically by believers and non-believers, by census of believers and non-believers, a tale that spread throughout history, throughout the globe, throughout the world, throughout nation upon nation, through country upon country. And here's the thing, 2,000 years on, 2,000 years on, 2024, 2,024 years from his birth to where we are now, we're still talking about Jesus. We do that with no one else, en masse, in the same way that we do Jesus Christ. We do that with no one else. We do that with no one else. Jesus has been more conversed around the dinner table than any other topic on the face of the planet. Guarantee you. Guarantee you. So if you ask me, do you believe in the stories of Jesus Christ? Yes, absolutely. It's the amazing thing that when I do these lectures and I do these talks and things, I always say, atheists, you're welcome. And you get this sort of blank look, like, why the heck is he welcoming us? You know, this is a story about the Bible, it's a story and a lecture about Jesus, about, you know, do you believe in the Bible? And people look at you like you've got three heads. Transgender folk, you're welcome as well. Lesbians, homosexuals, LGBTQI community, you're all welcome. Here's the thing, I may say things that you don't agree with, I don't care. You may live a life that I don't agree with. I don't care. Because there's a thing when people say to me, what is your stance on this? What is your stance upon that? I play dumb. I say I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I learned this from Jordan Peterson. When the moment that you speak and you come across as the teacher rather than the student, the, stu the, the teacher's always going to be knocked off the pedestal because in people's minds they're like, oh, well, he's the one who knows everything. But the student is given grace. Because he's still learning, or she's still learning. Here's the thing, when again, I say, atheist, you're welcome. LGBTQI community, you're welcome. Why? Because even if you're an atheist, this book, this book that has surrounded humanity for over 2,000 years, actually closer to probably 10,000 years. This book that is, has literally driven some people mental and insane, and has caused more wars, than anything else by people's understanding and then acting upon these things. The Bible itself hasn't. But people have done this to themselves. 
can also be used as one of the greatest tools that we have at our disposal. And in 2024, it has never been more needed. You say, well, how on earth can you make that claim? Simple. If you're an atheist, you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, fine. Do you believe in wisdom? Yes, obviously, duh. Do you believe in a step-by-step -step guide on how to live your life? Well, yeah, I read tons of self-help books. Really? Here's the thing. You go to Ecclesiastes, you go to the Songs of Solomon, you go to Psalms, you go to Proverbs. You're going to find some of the greatest wisdom that ever, ever existed on the planet. It will, uh, it will literally teach you how to avoid immoral women. It will teach you how to be a better man. It will teach you how to be a better human being. It, for women, it will teach you how to choose a good husband. The criteria that you need to meet, instead of trying to do it all yourself. It will teach you how to build a business. It will teach you how to manage your family. It will teach you more things in one page and one word than you will find on Coronation Street or EastEnders an entire year. But because people hear the Bible and it's because it's been so shockingly taught on Sunday mornings by the majority of preachers who quite frankly should hold their head in shame because they're more bothered about following a doctrine, a theology, an ideology, not rocking the boat. Guess what? They're getting paid thousands and thousands, 30, 40, 50,000 a year to stand up there, do their nice cute little sermon, dance around, wiggle a bit, bring God out on a Sunday morning, do a little bit of a dance and number with God and then put him back in the box again and people go home on a Sunday afternoon and they're like, oh, praise the Lord, I've been to church today. My life's changed. Hallelujah. <laughs> really? Oh, that's good water. <laughs> the reality is, thank you, the reality is that the Bible is one of the most powerful books on the face of the planet. It drove Martin Luther absolutely insane because he believed that there was some undisclosed sin that he had not declared before the Lord. Now let's get into that a little bit. What is sin? Sin is falling short of what you know you are capable of doing. Sin is falling short of your best self, if you want it in modern language. Sin is having a criteria and either doing the opposite which you know isn't beneficial. Now, I've said this before, that I may have blown it with God. And you say, no, no, how can you do that? You know, you, you are a Christian minister, you're a youth minister, you, you did all these amazing things, you reached people, you cared for people, you did this, you did that, you did the other. Here's the thing about it. I am not a really good saint. <laughs> I'm one hell of a sinner. But I love Jesus. But I have to accept as well that contrary to popular belief, I may have blown it. I may have blown it getting into heaven. Now, if God is gracious to me, he may let me wander the earth after all the madness is gone and it's done and dusted. He may let me roam the earth. And there'll be a few people there that I can say hello to. Maybe you'll let me govern the end, tend to the animals and, and, and all of those kind of things. Maybe. Maybe you'll be like Moses. Maybe like Moses. Maybe you get to see heaven from, a, from the distant land. I don't know. But here's the amazing thing. Despite having that question in my mind, Lord, have I completely blown it with you because of my own struggles, my own battles, my own shortcomings. And I'm completely at peace with that. I'm completely at peace with that. Okay? And that's the thing, sometimes you can you can get so so mentally ill, let's let's put it that way, in the world in which we live, in the things that we're exposed to, in the struggles that we see every single day. You can get so in your own head and you can screw things up so badly. that you are asking that question. I may have blown it with God, but the amazing thing is, I can still use my voice to ensure that someone else goes to heaven. 
If that's the ind indeed the intended destination, the Native Americans believe that there is no death, there is just a changing of worlds, a changing of forms. The Buddhists believe in reincarnation. So literally you go round and round and round and round again. And if you ever got to see the, um, the uh, American TV series, The Good Place, you'll know all about this. You know, that they, they arrive in what they believe to be the good place, but it's actually the bad place. And then they try really hard because they really want to get into the good place. They finally get into the good place and they're like, oh my goodness, that's boring. You know, sitting around holy, holy, holy every single day, getting to do all the things you want to do for eternity. And then the amazing thing about it is that they go through this final door that allows them to die, to, to, to be done, to be finished. But then there's part of them, there's, there's part of their atoms that will go into somebody else. And we're getting way off topic here. But that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's why we do this ministry, because I think that the days of just having a simple Sunday morning service where I stand up and I tell you, right, you should tithe. Why? Don't know. Tells you in the Bible. I've literally had ministers do this. I sat under some ministers for 15 years. I worked in churches for 15 years. Can I remember a single sermon that any one of them preached? No. Can I give you a direct sermon for what Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley, no longer with us, preached? Yes. One of his main things was trust God and leave all the consequences to him. What about what Jordan Peterson, what Wayne Dyer, what Alan Watts? I think we have to honestly get woken up enough as believers in God to wake up and say, well, hang on a second. Great, we've got a Bible. We've got a, a book here that tells, guess what? Lao Tzu, who started the Taoist movement 300 years before Christ or 3,000 years before Christ, one or the other, he was talking about a lot of the things that you read in Proverbs. The Tao, the, the Tao does nothing but leaves nothing undone. That's why people go through their life, you know, quietly and gently. They never try and do massive things and big things because guess what? There is great power in ambiguity. There is great power in being a nameless face. You don't believe me? Ask Mark Driscoll. You don't believe me? Ask some of these other big celebrities. Ask Julie Garland, ask Elvis Presley, oh wait, you can't. Ask Marilyn Monroe, oh wait, you can't. Because they came, they literally was at the top of their game, they were miserable. They were miserable, fame is a fickle thing. And the Bible warns you of that. So if you are put into a famous position, as I know some people are here tonight, you've got to really treat that as a double-edged sword. The Bible talks about that as well. You've really got to treat these things as a double-edged sword. The power of life and death is found in the tongue. Guess where that's from? That's from the Bible. So when people say to me, do you believe in the Bible? Absolutely. Because <laughs> guess what? It is the very thing that will save you. Or at least warn you from not making some massive, massive mistakes. I've had people come into our church before in our, in our old youth group. We had volunteers that were coming in, female volunteers, in the hopes that essentially I would go to bed with them after the youth service had finished. The Bible warns you about that as well. You know, be wary of wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of immoral women. I think it's long since overdue that preachers have got to get better. We cannot be still pulling out sermons from 35 years ago and expecting it to work in this day and age. Guess what? That's why the Church of Scotland is in the mess that's in. That's why the Baptist Church is in the mess that's in. That's why the Episcopal Church is in the mess that's in. The Church of England's in the, the Church of Wales, the Church of Ireland. The Evangelical Church has just had mass movements and people coming in they're like oh great this is brilliant wonderful hallelujah hallelujah no it isn't no it isn't because 
Because, 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 if you're running a church, you really need to think about the people that you have coming in. Why? You say, oh, well, we want butts on seats. We want a full church. That's a great thing. No, it isn't. Because guess what? One of the things that God has pointed out to me recently, the devil does his best work within the church. And it makes the most logical sense of all that that's where the devil is going to work. Why? Because if you think about it logically, if you are wanting to tear down your enemy's institution, your enemy's way of doing things, your enemy's reputation, then where's the best place to start? Oh, it's the place where your enemies believe they are safe and secure and they're holy and they're beyond reproach and everything else is in the church and that's exactly what the devil does. He works through more Christians to drive other Christians out of God's church than anything else and the sad thing about it is certainly on the west coast of Scotland you will be hard pressed to find and I mean this with all severity not just the west coast of Scotland England Ireland, the United States, Slovenia, Italy, perhaps. Italy seems to be one of the more holier places, believe it or not, mainly because I'm more Catholic. And I always joke with my wife that the Catholics got it right. She says, how could you say that? I said, simple, because they had 1,800 years of power before the Protestants came along. The Protestants got 200 years. They managed to screw everything up. And that's, that's just said, oh yeah, that's just said to get some fire going, to get some fire going. Because people can be really, really passionate about this. Guess what? They're more passionate for a religion, for a doctrinal belief that they know very little about than they are actually about the Word of God, the Bible. Or actually getting to know and understand God. If people actually got together and said, do you realize how the Catholic Church was formed? If people actually got together and said, do you realize how... Christianity continued, if you realize how Protestantism was formed, and all three have one major thing in common, it was all major bloodshed. Christian, godly, desiring blood was shed. Not because people were trying to find the truth, but because people wanted to control. And that's what we have now. That's why if I ever, if I ever was to church plan, I think it'd be a church of one. It'd be me and God. But in all seriousness, anybody that would want to come to a church that I'd founded, or that I planted, or whatever kind of nonsense that you want to put on that, I would be so wary of who I allowed into the church. And you say, well, that sounds like a bit of a tyrannical oppressive, narcissistic, psychopathic, possibly even sociopathic way. And I'm like, yeah, but guess what? If you don't look at the alternative, you are having people come into your church who could literally tear your church down like that. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen too many times. Because the church of God ends up being the church of the ego. The Bible warns you of that as well. Test everything that is said and see if it is truthful or not. Test the words that I've said tonight. As far as I'm aware, I haven't said anything maybe about the Protestant Catholic thing, you know. That's that's, that's me being flippant. That's me injecting humor. Because otherwise it gets to a heck of a browbeating. But hopefully this fires you up to start saying and looking around yourself and saying, you know what? Russell Brandt, Jordan Peterson. Other celebrities are returning to God, to Jesus specifically. Now I've got my suspicions with some of them as to why they're doing it. And my wife has even said, well, I believe them to be very disingenuine for doing this. And I said, yeah, but that's between them and God. That is not my place to judge, not my place to, to speak out against it. One thing that I am absolutely committed to, though, is I do know for a fact even, 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 even if they are liars and they are wolves in sheep's clothing, there's a lot of wolves that inadvertently can lead the sheep to God. He may get one or two of them, but if you've got 20 or 30 going to the Lord, that's, that's a big thing.
So, as we get ready to bring all this to a close, for the believers among you, when somebody next asks you, do you believe in the Bible? Come back with a wise answer. Really think. Because by thought, everything came into being. There is nothing that you can taste, hear, touch, smell, see, that hasn't come from thought. Every single thing came from thought. God had the thought to create man, woman, earth, animals, land, sea, sky, mountains, all of the other stuff. And he blew it out of his mouth. And he said, bang, here we go. And behold, the Lord saw. And it was good. The Lord saw and it was good. That's why, as Jordan Peterson rightly says, you have to believe that fundamentally people are good. That's, that's the thing that, that society hinges upon. That's the thing that every major faith talks about, even the Taoists. The Taoists have the belief that when taxes are too high, people go without. I believe it's the 87th verse of the, of the Tao Te Ching, which you can find on YouTube, considered one of the, the holy most spiritual books ever put forth. Me, personally, I believe that Wayne Dyer's Everyday Wisdom is one of the most holy spiritual books that's ever put forth because of the energy that you absorb while listening to that book. That's a whole other story, a whole other topic for a whole other time. But I want to put that out there for people looking for next steps. The Tao Te Ching, Everyday Wisdom, you can find them both read by Dr. Wayne Dyer, who is one of my teachers, among many. But the Tao Te Ching talks about it specifically. When people are left alone, and when there are no laws, the majority of people, the majority of people, will do good. Now there is a country where there is a lawless society. And you find that that is not indeed the case. So you have to exercise wisdom with that. Because while people are fundamentally good, we all have the ability to be fundamentally evil as well. And I don't care whether you're Mother Teresa, whether you're Andrew Tate, whether you're Adolf Hitler, whether you're Saddam Hussein, whether you're Joseph Stalin, whether you're David Beckham, whether you're Prince Charles, King Charles, whether you're the Pope, whether you're the Dalai Lama, whether you're Nisargadatta Maharaj, whether you're the Buddha, whether you were Dr. Wayne Dyer, whether you were Florence Scovel Shin, every single person has the ability to be phenomenally saint-like and also inherently evil. Every single one of them. And every philosopher worth their salt, if you go back to the institution of knowledge back in Greece, many, many hundreds and thousands of years ago, in the times of Aristotle and Plato and Patongeles, and they're walking through and there's a great painting that I have a uh, reproduction of in my office. And Aristotle, and I believe it's Patongeles, are having this conversation. One is thoroughly, 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 thoroughly focused and in favor of the spirit. The other one, is thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly convinced that human beings are dictated to by the ego. And then whoever came next, we were, I actually forget whether it was Aristotle, but basically said, imagine that you are riding on a white stallion. And you're also riding on a black stallion. In between them is you. One is the ego, one is the spirit, and you are tethered to both of them. And it is your job to rein them both in. We're getting into philosophy now. And this is just a start. This is just a start. But before I go too far down that war rabbit warren, when next you are asked, 
Is the Bible true? That is a very different question than if somebody asks you, do you believe in the Bible? If you're asking me, can I see, hear, touch, taste, and smell this tangible book that is in front of me that was 88 books, that's now down to 66 books because the, the canon of scripture was canonicalized back in the 800s, then yes, I absolutely 100% believe it is real. Oh, well, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you, do you believe in the teaching of Jesus? That's something completely different. Let's go into that then. Do I believe in the teachings of Jesus? Turning water into wine. Well, we've seen scientifically that that's not other realms of possibility. Walking on water. Again, we've seen scientifically that it is not other realms of possibility. Given the right circumstances and the right conditions and the right belief patterns. That is why science is actually one of the greatest things to prove faith to prove spirituality, to prove Christianity, to prove the teachings of Jesus. Why? Because science proves what the Bible teaches. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't disproven anything. Despite what a few may say, the majority come back with, I'm a scientist. Do you believe in God? Absolutely. What it comes down to, what they're really, really asking is this. Do you believe that the teachings of a carpenter's son some 2,000 years ago are real? And do you believe that that same carpenter's son died on the cross and three days later, came back to life. Is the kicker. Science has also proven that. And I'm not the only one to say that. There are many, the copious amounts of papers out there. Copious amounts of papers. They don't talk about it and publicize it too much. Why? Because you know how freaked out some people would be? Oh, so-and-so came back to life. He was pronounced dead, la 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 la. He came back to life. <laughs> but it is real. Until someone proves otherwise. And people always say, yeah, but you know, when you die, you're dead, you know, and that's it. Except for one. Except for one. And I'm going to end with this. This was something that Wayne Dyer had said many, many moons ago. And this is for the atheists, this is for the non-believers, this is for, for the Christians, for everybody, for every single person within the sound of my voice and beyond that's listening to this. Nobody, I repeat, nobody has enough information, has enough wherewithal, has enough reason to be a pessimist. Because being a pessimist goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning. Being a pessimist believes yourself to be the teacher, that you know it all, that you understand absolutely everything. Throughout the chronicles of history, you understand the mind of God, you understand the way, the truth, and the life to the nth degree. You understand it more than Jesus. You understand it more than the Holy Spirit. You understand it more than Alan Watts, Wayne Dyer. You understand it more than Michael Singer. You understand it more than Tony Robbins. You understand it more than some of the most influential, incredible people throughout history. Not just our time, but throughout history. That's what you're saying. And if they came back, and their final words in many cases was, I haven't got a bloody clue. <laughs> I ain't got a bloody clue one way or another. Whether it was true or it's not. Even Albert Einstein himself. Through the conclusion, there has to be a God. Darwin gave upon his faith, not because he no longer believed in God per se, but he gave upon his faith 
because he was an emotionally destroyed human being after his daughter died and passed away. And you say, well, why didn't God step in and save Darwin's beautiful daughter? Why didn't he do something? What an a-hole God is. Well, hang on a sec. Yes, something terrible happened. Equally, if you go back, as I've written about for the last 10 years, and you study Victorian times, and you study the life of a Victorian, particularly a Victorian who travelled around a lot, particularly Victorian in London, particularly Victorian who wasn't particularly wealthy, and you really explore what their life was like, that's why in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, it says God at times will rescue the young to prevent them from the evils of this world, to prevent them from seeing the evils of this world. Here's the real kicker. Here's, here's what I believe to be the fundamental point of Darwin's story. If God steps in and says, Darwin, your daughter is not going to die today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. You never get the theory of evolution. You never get, and if you have the chance to, to read or listen to some of Darwin's teachings, especially when he's on the voyage, and he's got a great novel out, and I forget the name of it, it's available on Audible, just type in Darwin, it'll come up. But he basically does the voyage of a lifetime in which he encounters turtles and crabs, and, 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 and it's just like, Oh my goodness, this, this is the ultimate. It would never get published today. But it is the ultimate phenomenal tale. But if God steps in and saves Darwin's daughter, one soul, evolution never comes about. The idea of natural selection is never founded. You never have one of the wisest people on the planet that speaks words that are so powerful that reaches my soul back in 2021, which phenomenally changed my life forever. Only when we are free Can ideas thrive? Words to that effect. Words to that effect. Only when we become free can our ideas thrive. Darwin's daughter is saved. I never have that piece of information. I never encounter one of the greatest teachers of all time. You never encounter him. Millions of other people never encounter Darwin. Sometimes God has bigger plans in mind than just giving you what you want. And I do firmly believe there is a story that is being unveiled right here, right now, just the same as there has been since the dawn of time. And if you don't believe me, go and read from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Read from one end of the book to the other. And then come back and ask me, do you believe the Bible is true? That's a problem for many. They want to criticize the Bible. They want to criticize that which they have no idea of its meaning. Which they've never read firsthand. I have read that book cover to cover no less than 17 times. I read the entire New Testament when I was in hospital in 2012. Stuck to a wall being pumped full of IV fluid. Because colitis was out of control. I was steroided out of my brains. <laughs> and I read that book cover to cover. And I was, my goodness, I was filled with that Holy Ghost power. I was preaching sermons to the nurses and the inmates on the ward. 
And we were having a blast because each one of us was as high as the next. <laughs> I am not your average preacher. I am not your average teacher. And the wonderful thing about it is you have an option to either go back to a church on a Sunday morning and listen to the same old stuff that you've heard day in and day out for however many years, or to go forth from this place, this day, to think, to use your mind, to understand, to take what you have learned here and through Scripture and through the words and teachings of Jesus Christ, from Moses to Joshua, from Ruth to Esther, to Solomon, to David, to Peter, to Paul, to Stephen, to John, John of Patmos, John the Baptist, And you can go forward in amazing ways. Do not allow people to spoon feed you what you should be taught and what you should think. You are in control. You are in control. You are in control of your own thoughts. And it has been my pleasure to be here with you tonight, to share this with you. And I hope it has been deeply, deeply insightful. As with all our lectures, Nothing is ever pre-scripted. Everything that you've heard tonight, I believe, like I do with everything in life, to be fully divine. As everything in life is, you were meant to be here tonight. People listening to this online were meant to be listening to this message. I have been John Morris, and it has been my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Come and visit us online, of course, as always. You can get in touch with us at thejohnmorris.co.uk. There's links all over the place. And I hope to come back to speak to you again soon. Thank you.